Um, the three panelists on my right, you've already heard from this morning. So I want to take this opportunity to introduce the three panelists on the left, or rather to allow them to introduce themselves. And each of them is going to, just in uh, two, two and a half minutes, tell you who they are, why they care about what is an event, and what they're passionate <laughs> about in that question, and then something about themselves that not many people know. <laughs> Emily. I'm Emily Edlam. I'm a PhD student from Cambridge in the Quantum Information Department. So for why I, I am interested in events, uh, I want to go back to something I read some years ago um, about uh, Descartes cogito ergo sum, and bear with me, it is relevant. Um, so this is an argument to the effect that it shouldn't really be, I think, therefore I am. It should be, I think, therefore there is a thought. Um, and I think that distinction <laughs> is, is really very important because essentially the point is that our, our conscious experience, our fundamental datum, is not of a persisting entity, it's of a series of, of events. Um, and more generally, our physics is a physics of change, um, of, of, of interaction. And though we may cast that in terms of uh, persisting objects or states, fields, wave functions, um, essentially all those things are constructs that we're putting on top of this underlying uh, set of, ev of events, um, which to me, makes it seem natural to, to see if, if we can possibly uh, simplify our ontology by getting rid of those constructs and going to an ontology that has <coughs> is just made up of events. Um, and that idea is quite nicely expressed in uh, Bell's GRW uh, flash model, flash ontology, which is basically the idea that we can take a model like the idea GRW uh, spontaneous collapse model and get rid of the wave function entirely and have an ontology that is just the collapse events or flashes as Bell calls it. And Bell rather magnificently has this description of the world being made up of processes and people and objects which are all really just what he calls constellations of flashes. Um, and I don't want to in, uh, endorse the GRW flash model you know, in its entirety as a final solution to quantum mechanics or anything like that. But it does seem to be an interesting illustration, not least because it is um, automatically Lorentz invariant, and thus is one of the very few uh, uh, realistic single world Lorentz invariant um, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, but that, that Lorentz invariance comes with an interesting caveat, which is that uh, you, you only get the Lorentz invariance if you limit yourself to considering uh, possible entire distributions of flashes, uh, renouncing any account of the coming into being of the actual, actual distribution of the flashes, uh, which seems to suggest that taking this kind of event ontology view t leads you naturally to an approach where um, the course of history is determined kind of externally or all at once, rather than following the kind of internal temporal evolution that we normally think of. And that's interesting to me because it seems to me that that could be a very interesting clue for where the future development of fundamental physics ought to go. Um, and for something that people, you probably don't know about me, uh, you probably know nothing at all about me, so <laughs> um, I, I'm a New Zealander, I think I'm probably the only one here. If I'm not, please come and say hello if you're else also a Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. So, uh, Klaus. Yeah, I'm Klaus Kiefer from the University of Cologne. Um, I did my PhD in the 80s with Dieter C, who was the first to a discussed decoherence in 1970, and my task then was to apply decoherence to the gravitational field, which I did, I mean, to quantum cosmology, and this has been the yeah, subject of a part of my research for over the years, not only in quantum cosmology, but also together with um, Polaski and Starobinsky on the quantum fluctuations in the early universe, so um, how to understand, I mean, the um, classicality of the CMB anisotropies coming from the bunch davies wake on quantum fluctuations. Now, about the event and why, why this is interesting, well, um, quantum theory, at least for me, seems to be universally valid. So in uh, quantum mechanics, we have uh, the Schrodinger equation and unitary time evolution. And so it's not clear, I mean, how the events emerge that we observe. So certainly this is a big question also in quantum gravity, where there is no time, timeless equations. And uh, this is def definitely one of the important questions um, that relate to the quantum to classical transition. So why is there a classical world? And about things that you don't <laughs> know about me, I don't know what is important, but uh, originally I wanted to become an obser observational astronomer, so I was a hobby astronomer, and I studied astronomy, and my first publication back in 81 was actually ob an observation of a comet um, that I did myself, and that was published in the Minus Circular. 
But then I was actually, I encountered general relativity mm -hmm. and I was seduced by theoretical physics. So um, <laughs> fortunately, maybe for the observational astronomers that I did not enter them because... <laughs> and, and, and is it named after you? Is it the Kiefer comet? No, no, I did not, no, I did not um, <laughs> discover the comet. I, I observed the comet and uh, calculated the trajectory. So um, this was the comet Stefan Oterma. And it already has come back, so you see how long ago this was. Um, uh. And uh, so, so at that time, at that time there were no computers, so we went there at night and opened the cupola, and it was twenty minus twenty degrees, and we had to take mm -hmm. photographic plates and develop them in the in the dark chamber, um, with a lot of risks, of course. And um, then we we made this old fashioned, um, I don't know the name of these um, devices, where you have on the, the left eye the the stellar maps and the right your own photographs and then we have made a lot of reductions actually with with logarithmic tables and the Great. like and we have then found the coordinates and surprisingly at the end when it was published also the other uh, observations our point was on the trajectory splendid, so, splendid. So <laughs> well, despite all these uncertainties in doing these things i mean we were students at that yeah. time somehow made when it. edmund halley observed his comet <laughs> in oxford his eponymous comet uh, it was not going to return within his lifetime so you're luckier yeah i'm always lucky but i did not so. observe it when he came back <laughs> mary okay hello to everybody my name is mary sacellariado i come from my uh, king's college london uh, so a few things about me i work in early universe cosmology so what I care for more is to take uh, models of quantum gravity and try to build uh, cosmological models, which you can test. So on the one hand, you can test the validity of these quantum gravity proposals. On the other hand, you can have an early universe cosmological model, which is motivated by some fundamental theory. So I've been uh, working in models from loop quantum gravity, uh, from uh, string theory, from non-commutative geometry, more recently from group field theory. So that's what I work and that's what I will try to continue. So why I care about event? Because I mean, for me, event is an uh, emergent uh, thing and the event somehow leads to a manifestation of the arrow of time. So it's important to know what it is. Uh, it would bring us from a kind of quantum past to the classical uh, present. So it's uh, something we'd better, I mean, we should understand better if we want to understand what the arrow of time is. Uh, now, something about me which you don't know. I mean, I don't know how much you know to say mm -hmm. how much you don't know. Uh, but anyway, the one thing that probably nobody knows uh, is that I've been working for, uh, for uh, I mean, I started my studies in mathematics. I went to astrophysics, then to theoretical physics. I go to more and more abstract things. But at some point, I convinced uh, that the theoretical physicist can do everything or anything. So I got a job as a consultant in the United Nations in New York. It was amazing. When I got this job, I had to convince myself that I could do what I was supposed to do. It was, uh, it was quite, uh, I mean, uh, nice. It was a very nice experience. It was a huge salary. I was uh, missing uh, physics, so I stayed for four months, and then I went back to, uh, to physics. <laughs> so that's all. Thanks very much indeed. Well, thanks for those Um, so what we might do now is to uh, dive straight in, and uh, I've got in front of me the feedback from the discussions that people had on their walks and excursions and things yesterday, and uh, there are one or two answers where there seem to be sort of more or less uh, consensus. So uh, what I'm going to do is to pick some of the more controversial answers uh, and see what people uh, make of those. So. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll pick two of those that are both to do with processes, and uh, we might um, perhaps um, start with someone on that side and then alternate on the two sides. But uh, with uh, this question, as with all of them, there's no need for everybody to talk, so don't feel you've got to say anything if you feel that uh, uh, what's already need, uh, been said is what needs to be said, or just you've got nothing to contribute. But do also please pace your answer, because if everybody gives a long answer to this question, we'll never get onto any of the other questions. So here's the, uh, the, the uh, two of the statements that came up from yesterday. Um, there are no events, no clicks, nothing happening. We have processes rather than events. 
And then another answer in the same vein is, measurements are never precisely point-like events. They are processes taking place over non-zero time in a space-time region of non-zero volume. Who'd like to start with that one? Well, if I can say something about that, I don't think that I agree very much with this statement. For me, an, uh, an event takes place in time and some local space, but certainly it just takes place in time that would give uh, a manifestation of, of, of time, of measuring time. So I would not agree that, I mean, events, they don't take any time. Uh, that was supposed to be a controversial statement. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Brendan's labeled it as. Do you want to well, chip in, Charlie, then? No, I mean, I, well, of course, I've got my own opinions about this, but that, that, that everything can unhappen. But that if you are, that event is an, approx oh, an event is an approximation uh, for something that is nearly irreversible or in, irreverse, irreversible for all practical purposes. And of course, it doesn't happen at a point in space-time. Well, let me pick you up on, so one of the other contributions yesterday was given the discussion of perspectivity, perhaps an event has to be a weaker thing than a matter of fact that can't unhappen. Yeah, I, I think I'm the one who said that. So. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> now, then can you tell us what it means? <laughs> Do you want to explain what it means, Charlie? What, something, well, I always like, it's just a, much of these things, these discussions are matters of taste in interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. So I, I guess when I say anything can unhappen is that I always think takes your 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 seemingly irreversible process and put a put a box around it, a perfectly reflective box, and let it let it uh, marinate in there until it unhappens and recoheres. Mm. So I just I mean that's pretty impractical, but it's, it's 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 an idea that appeals to me, so I keep using it. Yeah, well, it's a, it's one that's used in practice to some extent in magnetic resonance. Mm. So you're willing to wait ten to the ten to the ten to the ten <laughs> ages of the universe. For this, for the recurrence time, for it to unhappen. Yeah, I'm in pretty good health. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you characterize that as unhappening? Well, in 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 the, the Vigner's friend, when it unhappens, the, the uh, Vigner will say, or his friend, now that he's uh, with Vigner, will say that I saw something, but. Uh, I don't remember what I saw, but I do remember that I saw one of these two outcomes. So the the thing that gets erased isn't that there was some uh, outcome, but it was which outcome happened gets erased. Yeah. So does um, does uh, Emily or Klaus want to come in on processes? Yeah. Oh, you can start. Uh, well, I have a s some objection to the notion of taking processes as being primary rather than events, because at, as I tried to express, I'm not sure that regarding events as happening in some kind of temporal un unfolding is the best way to look at them, given what we know about relativity. Um, and I think that if, once, if you take a, an a approach which is external rather than internal, um, it becomes less natural to think about events happening and then possibly unhappening. Um, events just are in, in a timeless way and they don't need to unfold in that kind of that kind of process like way. Sean, do you want to chip in on this? Well, so I don't know if we're going to get to this uh, at our group uh, meeting yesterday. My contribution was to say that the notion of event is an outdated relic of our classical past, and we should just stop using that word for everything. So, what do you mean past? Past <laughs> <laughs> events have, are points in space time. Past is a different thing, right? I do think I, I'm in favor of processes over events to that extent, I would say. Um, but I think that it, there's maybe a bit of a philosophical mistake uh, in saying that there is this idea that we thought was fundamental 
and inventive would be an example in our past ontology, a way of looking at the universe. And therefore, when we get a better ontology like quantum mechanics or quantum gravity, it behooves us to locate what that means in our new ontology. I think that's probably the wrong way to go about it. I think that we should take the new ontology for what it is, get its own consequences, and then there might be some very complicated map as an approximation and an emergence kind of relationship between the underlying stuff and the old way of talking and the notions like events or even processes might just not be there in the better way of talking that we now have. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question I wanted to ask that. So um, I, I think, you know, Seth's model is a great one, and any even finite dimensional Hilbert space, they're going to be an infinite family of um, ex exactly decoherent sets of histories. Um, that's actually a slight point to build up that well, that's a pretty separate conversation. Um, and if you allow approximate decoherence, then it gets much more badly infinite. Um, so if you want to regard all those things as sequences of events that happen to the different degrees of sets of degrees of freedom that define the course gradients that define those sets of history, what's wrong with that? So, one, so this new ontology says there are all these different uh, sets of experiences that these degrees of freedom might have. So you, many people want to add more to that. That's unsatisfactory. Right? That's, uh, so, you phrased it in a very pointed way. Who are the observers? What are the observers that should count? So my question is, um, very specifically, for what? Count for what? What are the additional criteria that are being added to say, why are these the sets of history that you care about? Good. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, nice way of putting it because we have an operational question as quantum cosmologists. Um, I, I think it is too permissive to allow all the decoherent histories to count as happening for the reason of we want to make a predictive model of the universe. So we think, it, it, depending on what you believe, but at least there's some fraction of the people who in the room who think that there might be many branches of the wave function, many parts of uh, classical space-time where things are very different. Therefore, there might be very many instantiations of people like me. There might be an infinite number of them. Oh, oh, not possible. Not possible. No, you're unique, Sean. <laughs> well, not me. I mean, like I'm speaking in the voice of somebody. Uh, so, therefore, we need. We, if that is true, and we would like to say, given that I am like me, what should I expect next? I want to conditionalize over this large ensemble of possibilities on the existence of someone with my experiences, my macroscopic knowledge of the world, and say, given that I have this information and given the wave function of the universe, what else should I expect? And to do that, I need to know what is the set over which I'm conditionalizing. Carl, do you want to come in on this? Um, maybe I can say something about the question we addressed yesterday in our group, namely, can we discuss meaningfully events in a unitarily evolving uh, quantum state? And we had some discrepancies in, in the group, so my opinion is that we can, that events are not fundamental, that we can understand in principle everything from unitary quantum mechanics, namely by the process, by the irreversible process of decoherence, which is uh, un unavoidable in most situations and which can be discussed at the basis of uh, entangling, entangling the quantum state with its environment. So, for example, if you have a, a molecule going through two slits, then um, as long as, it, as it's isolated, then it's in a superposition. There are no probabilities, there are no events, but the event uh, occurs, emerges irreversibly when it hits, say, the photographic plate in the sense of a narrow Gaussian wave packet. And then uh, it has happened, it cannot unhappen. I mean, there are things where interferences can um, be, um, can disappear for some time, for example, in the spin echo. Uh, but these are rather isolated systems, and uh, at the end you have recoherence. But recoherence it does not occur in, in, for all practical purposes in the macroscopic world. So events are, in my opinion, definitely secondary and not fundamental, but there was a controversy, and maybe Emily can, can tell the, the opposite viewpoint. Go on, Emily. Express the opposite viewpoint. <laughs> well, the opposite viewpoint was, I guess, the one I already expressed, that I, yeah. I think events are, are fundamental and the wave function is a summary of facts about past events and how, how they uh, relate to one another and how, how they cause future events. And in that sense, it's a calculational device rather than being the fundamental object. But, yeah, but for example, the wave function, um, um, when you say it's dynamic because there are experiments, for example, in radioactive decay, usually we have the exponential decay law, 
when the uh, decayed product is measured, but there are experiments where it's done under control in a cavity and then with superposition of undecayed and decayed state. So the decayed state can interfere again with the undecayed. And so this is, this is the full dynamics and it's described by the wave function. It's not just a collection of records. And it, these experiments have been done, or the experiments by Arroche and his group in, in Paris and, and by by Zeilinger, where they observe this gradual <coughs> emergence of, of the classicality, but also then under control, maybe some recurrence. So this is dynamics, that the basis of the wave function have physical information that you can see in experiments. So isn't this a contradiction to say it's just a record of... Um, so, so there's a long and you, complex discussion to be had about use, the reality of the wave. Could you use your microphones, because I think... People there's a long and hearing. complex discussion to be had about the real reality of the wave function, which we probably don't have time to rehearse here. Um, but I think that the view that the, re the wave function is informational in the summary of information about events and the view that it is ontological, uh, I would say empirically equivalent. And so uh, there are some experiments which are, more t which are attempting to describe in the, the, the way you've just you've talked about. There are other experiments which are more tempting to, to describe in the kind of informational way, way that I would prefer. And so, you know, I think just listing examples of experiments which went, and which ones seem better to, to uh, more tempting to talk about in different ways isn't necessarily a way of making progress here. So if we talk about, pick up the reality of the wave function um, and, and, and pick up one or two things that came up yesterday, um, uh, Tony Leggett um, would sometimes articulate it like this, um, for example in Science in 2005, but in other places too, that he often finds what he perceives to be a mismatch um, among his professional colleagues between on the one hand um, the huge level of justified confidence in the way that quantum mechanics describes experiments to a fantastic degree of precision. And on the other hand, um, the way they live their lives at an everyday level as you know, epitomized by their cats being either alive or dead, but not in a superposition <laughs> state of being alive and dead. I'd love to ask members of the panel whether they recognize that sort of mismatch in their own experience and their own lives that Tony Leggett was talking about, or whether they feel it's not a mismatch at all, or whether they've found a way of resolving it. I mean, what does it mean to say my cat is alive or dead? The only thing it means is that I can do an experiment in which the aliveness of the cat and the deadness of the cat will interfere with each other and give us results other than, you know, what it would happen if it was both, you know, if it was classically alive or classically dead. But of course, none of us can ever do any such experiment. Any such experiment would almost certainly kill the cat. Uh, <laughs> so you wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, you know, and the apparatus one would need would probably be more than all of the uh, atoms in the universe put together in order to generate the apparatus needed to make the cat uh, interfere in such a way. So, you know, I don't think there's any any conflict between the two. And if those physicists in their in their daily lives actually worried about spin one half electrons or something like that, they would sit down and they would do quantum mechanics on that. They wouldn't go ahead and say, I have my favorite spin a half and it's a lot it's up. Yeah. Um, it's a let's um move on. Who were the people over here? Don, next and you Thing. Yeah, I suppose I want that I do tend to think of the reality of the quantum state, and I think the but but what I think is even more real are our conscious perceptions, and I just think that each one has an associated positive operator, and the measure is given by the expectation by them. So that's sort of what's I suppose as far as my own life, I you know I do tend to think that there's you know different possible futures or future things. I mean, once I was at a conference at Lazouche and had the opportunity to go up on one, which I estimated a chance of one in a thousand to get killed which I calculated, this was before I was married. I would not do this with a family, it would not be responsible. But I did, I did decide, and, and it kind of, I realized it would reduce my life expectancy to by about 20 days, and I thought it was worth it. So I went up there, I am sorry for the, the, the tenth, tenth of a percent in which I probably got, I got killed, but anyway, I'm a Christian and believe I'd be resurrected in there, so I'd be okay by my parents. 
My parents were probably been sad, but they're dead now, so their sadness would have only lasted a few years. <laughs> Very good, Tom. Um, if you want to control, oh, you've gone back, yeah, next. Yeah, we've got a good cue now, yeah. So I just had a comment on the uh, cats and uh, whether you take quantum mechanics into account in your everyday life. Uh, I mean, no one's mentioned the quantum suicide or quantum Armageddon arguments, uh, so maybe I won't get into that, but I, I do agree that actually taking the reality of the entire wave function with all the different branches uh, might lead to very different decisions. Uh, if you really <laughs> think everything's going to be there. Uh, I don't actually, I'm more with Emily and Carlo, I don't take that point of view. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons, is that I think it sort of conflicts with the um, attitude towards probabilities that we sort of had when we built up the whole theory to begin with. So can but, you articulate what point of view you do take? Um, it would be closer to the idea that quantum wave function is a summary of our probabilities um, for events that we can observe uh, in measurements. But I wanted to make a point primarily about this um, interference experiment with the cat or other conscious being. Um, so I thought Bill made a really great point, which is that we can't do these experiments. They might essentially be impossible in principle, almost certainly in practice. Uh, they might involve getting enormous amounts of the universe um, isolated um, and then re-interfering all these degrees of freedom. Uh, and maybe that's just not possible. I mean, when you start using so much of the universe that there isn't really enough left. But I also want to make another point, and that is that even if you could do one of these experiments at huge expense, um, that doesn't mean that's what's going on with actual cats. I mean, unless we're all part of some quantum matrix in which somebody is doing this experiment with us. And so I, I don't necessarily think, and this maybe bears on smaller but still impressive interference experiments where macroscopic or complex degrees of freedom are interfered. Uh, you know, just because that's the story in certain cases doesn't mean that um, that's what's going on in everyday physics where it's not an experiment. So I wonder if anybody has any comments on that sort of second level of uh, distinction. Does anyone from the panel want to respond to that before we go on to the next question, comment, contribution? Next contribution. So I'm going to agree with Bill that the view of the world described by quantum mechanics is exactly consistent with the way we normally behave, or at least the way we normally endorse behaving as business people or actuaries or whatever, where we don't actually know everything to begin with, and we, you know, but I'm also going to mention that when Ken talks about feeling bad for all of the people who did get run over by a car every time we pass the street, etc., that I don't think you need quantum mechanics for that, but quantum mechanics is very useful for that. Like, we could, we seem to have, by a, f a function of how we're bra our brain is designed or whatever, some really serious difficulty with representing ignorance. And from a f philosophical perspective, the quantum mechanics that we mostly usually engage with isn't the quantum mechanics of entitlement, I'm uh, sorry, entanglement, <laughs> and actual quantum mechanics at all. It's the pseudo-quantum mechanics of knowing that we don't know everything by representing, that, by representing our ignorance as a part of the world instead of as a part of our minds because we're just so very, very bad at representing our ignorance as a part of our minds. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks. We're just nodding here, or at, uh, least, yeah. at least Charlie is. But, Seth. Uh, I'd like to remind Don uh, Page of a an event that occurred a long time ago when um, Don, as you know, is a many worlds kind of guy. And uh, Wojtek Zurich and I said, well, Don, how about if we have you play Russian roulette for money, right? You know, we'll give you a million dollars to play Russian roulette. You get to design your revolver so that the one sixth chance that you actually die is absolutely for sure determined by a quantum fluctuation. And I don't know if you remember what happened, but you said you had to think about it. <laughs> you had to think about it. So you went home that night and you thought about it and you came back the next day and you said, I'm sorry I can't do it. And we said, but Don, it's win-win. Five, six of the time you're alive and you're a million dollars richer. The other six of the time you're dead and you don't know about it. So are we, what's the matter? He said, and you said, well, in that one six of the time, my wife would be unhappy. Oh. <laughs> and he knew you didn't have a million dollars, so it was not really. <laughs> <laughs>
Can I just read something? This is a paraphrase, one of paraphrase words of Russell. This is actually in response to what Sean said about the whole notion of an event might just go away. So I'm going to want to put this notion of something that Bertrand Russell said a long time ago. So the notion of an event, I believe, like so much that passes muster among philosophers, <laughs> is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy, only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. <laughs> that quote is in my book, Seth. You should read the book. It's causality, of course, that he was making fun of. Chaslav. I'm actually not Chaslav. Oh, I beg your pardon. I do look like Chaslav. You do? Uh, there we go, there we go. Um, anyway, um, so uh, something Jim said uh, earlier prompted me to say, uh, when he was talking about the history of language, he said, um, uh, he was talking about how the history of language plays into this, and then somebody said something about formalism, and, I, and the first thing that popped into my head is, well, is formalism just in a language? And um, so I think uh, we have a tendency to take um, mathematics, the things that we use to describe this stuff as, as sort of being separate from all of that. And I, incidentally, I'm completely agnostic on whether mathematics is real or not. I know that there are people here who have written books on the whole topic, so I, I'm just gonna take an agnostic view on that. But um, there certainly are things, sort of at the very basic level, where mathematics has arisen to describe, uh, you know, the mathematics came out of our language and our, our ability to describe what was happening. You know, two people, cavemen, and they see two things and they understand that two things is greater than one, right? And so two plus, you know, one plus one equals two. And you, you get this natural sort of language. Now there's certainly something ontological about what's going on there. Um, but then when you abstract all the way up to Hilbert space, the question is, does it stay you know, that way? And um, I think when we're talking about events and things at that level, um, you have to sort of think about these kind of, kinds of questions. And I, I'm gonna give one other example. Um, so if we take Wheeler's it from bit completely literally, um, uh, and, and again, I don't, I don't really have an opinion, but if we were to take Wheeler's it from bit completely literally, and, and then ask, what's the difference between an event and a process? Okay, so what is the difference? Because we're making a distinction between events and processes here, at least in the language we're using. Yes, we are. Yes. So, but what is it? What is the difference between them? And at, at the it from bit level, it's not clear. Because is, an, is a process a series of events? Because at the it from bit level, there's, it's, it's very binary. It's just something, something else. That's it. So. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Comment about the uh, dichotomy that Carlo Rovelli uh, explains so well uh, the dichotomy between one point of view where the wave function is supreme uh, and we have to figure out how to get events happening as some approximation or maybe as some exact consequence of that, and the other point of view that events and happenings are part of this fundamental, and the wave function just represents our understanding of reality at a given time. Um, to me, the point of view where the wave function is supreme is a much more appealing point of view. And I'd like to explain why. Uh, I think our ultimate goal as physicists, and I like to keep in mind our ultimate goal, even if we don't plan to get there tomorrow, uh, but our ultimate goal, I think, is to have a theory of reality, a theory, a mathematical theory uh, that describes reality, or at least is capable of describing reality. And then the ideal would be that everything we see around us should be extractable from that theory. Uh, the wave function idea, I think, offers hope of that. Uh, the wave function would then be the complete description of reality. Uh, for the people who say that the wave function is only our knowledge of reality, as far as I can tell, they have no answer to the question of what would be the complete description of reality. If you have no answer to that, you really don't even have the starting point uh, for building a complete theory of reality. Uh, so, from my point of view, the way we should be trying to proceed, just because I think it does a much better job of putting us in the direction of what I perceive as our ultimate goal, uh, is to think of the wave function as supreme. And observations are obviously very complicated things. It has to do with what's going on in our brains and our eyes and uh, our sensory perceptions in our skin. Obviously, that's going to be complicated, and obviously, we're only going to have approximate answers uh, to how to describe those things. 
uh, until we have a really complete understanding of how our brains and our sensory perceptions work. So I'm perfectly willing to think of happenings and observations as something which at this point we can only describe approximately and only have a vague idea of what we're talking about. Uh, and we can still think of the wave function as being supreme. And things that we do know how to measure directly from the wave function, like the fine structure of hydrogen, uh, we get right to 12, 14 decimal places. Um, so to me, that is the preferable point of view. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> well, so, uh, unless there's a term called uh, So first of all, uh, well, I'm with uh, Alan, who I think just said it very nicely with regard to what, well, how we should look at quantum mechanics and the, say, supremacy of the wave function. Uh, but whether or not you believe that, uh, which, you know, again, I think is a very good point of view, and, and we, if you don't believe that, it would be good to hear an alternative. There's another thing that has not been really fully considered in this discussion, and that is, you know, really we're talking about a world that has quantum mechanics and gravity. And, you know, quantum mechanics already makes it difficult to uh, precisely define what an event is, as we've been discussing, but in the context of gravity, and also where you really have quantum mechanics present as well, you know, there's another layer of difficulty with defining what you mean by an event. Uh, you know, an event in classical GR is a point in space-time. Well, it's pretty clear that we don't have any operational or sensible way of defining points in space-time in the context of a quantum theory of gravity. No one, well, there are at least you know, proposals and models for how you might do something like that, but there, there are also some serious obstructions to really thinking precisely of something like a point in space-time or any other sharp definition of an event in the context of quantum gravity. So that's something you know, we really need to consider if we're trying to describe a theory of events uh, in the theory of the physics of the known universe. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Jenny Harrison. I'm a mathematician from Berkeley, and I don't do that much physics yet. <laughs> but I'm looking at uh, physics from a foundational viewpoint of what you can see from a mathematical viewpoint. And it's extremely important to understand whether or not a mathematical structure arises naturally or whether it's concocted by humans. And we're trying to look at only those structures which arise naturally. And how do we know? And so I say to my students, well, if an alien in a, across a, a distant galaxy comes up with technology, what mathematics do they know? And our mathematics should overlap and intersect and be the same. And we can throw away a lot of things like the von Kraus snowflake and things that mankind invents because they're fun, but they don't give us very much. Um, I'm not saying they're completely useless, um, but from what we want to do, which is, which is fundamental physics, they are rather useless. We want to see what is natural. So as I'm talking because Ian mentioned this about the one plus one equals two versus Hilbert space. And at one point, we start getting suspicious that we've constructed something which is useful for us, but may not in fact be the ideal space. For example, Hilbert space may not be. Uh, so I want to propose that there may be other topological vector spaces which may have better properties, which will satisfy the question of naturality. And then finally, how do you know? Well, mathematicians have developed a theory of testing for naturality, and that is um, category theory. And so if you, you've probably heard of that by now, because many physicists talk about it, but it's worth learning, um, because it will guide you in your choices of what you spend your time on. Thank you very much. Hi there. I also wanted to weigh in on Carlo's uh, uh, two, two approaches. I, I really appreciated uh, Alan's perspective and thought I'd, I'd give the opposite one. And uh, this ties into what we just heard, that you know, there are things about physics that are, are built by humans. And you have to look and say, well, where, where did this formalism come from that we use? Why did we develop it? Um, where did configuration space come into quantum theory? And uh, what we built quantum theory to predict the future of experiments that we don't know how they're going to be set up. We, we built this giant configuration space to deal with all possible future measurements that might happen. And that's why it's so big. And then you say, well, wait a second, all possible measurements aren't going to happen. Only one measurement's going to happen, and we don't know which that measurement is yet. But if we did know, we would not need this giant configuration space. Uh, the, the open question that Alan raised, 
if you take the sci epistemic viewpoint, what is reality is an excellent, crucial question to ask. But we do have somewhere to start, and that is classical general relativity, something that was not built up to predict the future, but was actually built up from principles. Um, it was built up from a couple beautiful principles. So we have this beautiful theory. And to say that, let's just assume this has to emerge, uh, is maybe not the place we want to put all of our eggs. Maybe we should spend some effort trying to build a realistic space-time theory that doesn't even have to be perspectival. Uh, you, you, sold, you sold the science to make you short, Carl. It, does, it can be the classical definition of event. If the future choice of measurement is there somehow in the universe, and we're just waiting to find out what it is. Thanks, thanks. So we'll have Adrian and Matt, and then there's one person behind Matt. I can't see who it is. And then I'll bring it back to the panel. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I also very much appreciated Carlo's comments and Alan's um, full, careful expression of one perspective on, on theory. Um, I wanted, I wanted <coughs> to say something for a view that has been represented, but slightly un underrepresented. Um, we, we have a lot of good and interesting ways of, characterize, of potentially characterizing objective reality that are aligned with quantum mechanics, but add a little bit of extra, extra structure. So Emily's already mentioned the flash ontology of GRW. But there are Bohmian ideas, which haven't, haven't really been touched on in this conference. Ken, Ken has some tentative ideas. We had Bohmian ideas yesterday. We, uh, I'm sorry, we did. Um, there's um, Jim and Murray's proposal for, for selecting a probability distribution for a single fine-grained history. Uh, there's uh, one, one perspective on work that Jess Riedel and others have in pro progress is that it gives a, a way, a rule for selecting one particular branch of the universal wave function that gives a probability distribution of the branches when we pick that one branch. I have my own ideas, I could go on. But we, we sh I, I suppose I'm trying to suggest there's actually a lot um, a lot of interesting approaches um, that potentially solve exactly what Alan has highlighted. And the alternative is Everettian quantum mechanics. And the truth, the truth about that is there are a lot of different ideas about what that means. And many people have problems with many of those. Most people have problems with them, most of those. So <laughs> we, we have a dilemma. Thanks, Adrian. Sure. Matt. I, um, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, yeah, not too much, because we're coming up to lunch. Very, very <laughs> about the, um, the psychology of different opinions people have about the fundamental nature of events. Um, from my own perspective, I spent far too much time, more time than any human being should, thinking about the foundations of quantum theory. And so I know it's a complete mess. So I completely distrust any intuition whatsoever that comes from quantum mechanics about the nature of events. On the other hand, I see general relativity over there, which I spent far less time thinking about, and everything looks nice. So it says there are events, so I believe that. Um, so I think, I, I believe that sort of Sean's opinion is the opposite of mine, because he spent uh, a lot of time and he knows how much of a mess general relativity and cosmology are. Um, <laughs> So I guess I want to just end with a question to the panel, which is uh, those of you who do trust the intuitions coming from quantum theory, why do you trust those more than those that come from general relativity? We might come back to that at the end. Okay. Uh, Alex Wills, also just a mathematician. Um, <laughs> as is directed, I suppose, principally at Sean Carroll, but Anybody else who wants to I think to we're going to come back to the panel after this conversation. Oh, okay, here. that's fine. So the yeah. good question is this. If I'm going to take a, a Hilbert space as my starting point, and I'm willing to regard a unit vector or maybe a rank one projection as a state, and go from there, fine. Why can't I also regard that same mathematical object as an event does the formalism tell me to do one versus the other? And if not, why do we have to choose? OK, thanks very much. So what, what I'd like to do now is just to pick up one of the points that emerged from the um, discussions yesterday that we haven't touched on, I don't think yet, um, 
but by all means relate this to what we have, and that is the, the role of information. And a couple of the uh, comments that came up was that um, uh, events are the opposite of informational isolation, or an event is a process of information acquisition. Who'd like to comment on one of those two statements, or both of them? I think you need to be very careful about using the term information in that kind of fundamental sense, because it's easy to use, it's easy to talk about information without really having a clear idea of what you mean by that term. Um, and I like to go with the view that information is is essentially a state of a physical system. Mm -hmm. um, and so then it's not necessarily clear to me that it makes sense to say that an event is a process of information acquisition because you know, systems already have states. This is meant to be, are, you, are we saying that an event is just an interaction between two physical states? It, you know, if that's, what, that's what's meant, then let's say that and not mm -hmm. obscure it by talking about information. Does anyone here want to say anything about that? Maybe I can yeah. get there, but I want to respond very please, quickly to these last Sean, two yeah. Um, yeah. interventions. So I think that, uh, Matt Leifer made a very interesting point that, uh, but, but in fact, even though we come to opposite conclusions, we actually start from the same point. I completely agree that notions of, of things like events and observables and what happens are infinitely more clear in general relativity or in any classical theory than they are in quantum mechanics. And I completely agree that the foundations of quantum mechanics are much uh, more problematic than those of general relativity. So it's a very good question to ask why I would privilege quantum mechanics over general relativity at the end of the day. And you know, the answer is just I think that quantum mechanics is a more fundamental view of the world. I think that general relativity uh, fits squarely into the old Newtonian paradigm of states that evolve deterministically and can be measured to arbitrary accuracy. And there's not that much to say about the interpretation of it and, and what is an event and so forth. And these questions are much more problematic in a quantum context. And I do not take that to be a reason to reject the the foundational mad dog quantum version of the world as the right one, it just is a lot more work for us to figure it out. So good, full employment for theoretical physicists, which is what we need these days. Um, and then to the, the next question very quickly, um, why not just call the quantum state an event? Uh, you know, it's a free country, you can call whatever you want, whatever you want. But clearly in general relativity, an event has this technical meaning of a point in space-time. Space-time is a smooth manifold and there are elements of it and every element is an event. Uh, the quantum state is a state. It is, it is a very different thing than a point in space-time. The, the analogy in general relativity would be a complete configuration of the metric and its conjugate momenta and all the fields and particles and their conjugate momenta. Nobody calls that an event, so I wouldn't want to call the uh, quantum state an event. To excuse me saying all this to get back to the actual question you know, I think that when we do as as Jim correctly points out you know we have these old outdated excess baggage vocabulary terms and we look to match them up to our newfangled much more powerful but mysterious formalisms and ontologies how do we do that and part of the point of view I was trying to advocate in my talk that we not only have wave functions and states, but when we do match up to our everyday experience, we assume a lot more in terms of low entropy initial conditions, arrow of time, branching of the wave function, uh, increasing entropy. The flow of information is crucial to all of that story. Why we find it convenient to talk about certain things in our semi-classical approximate world as events has a lot to do with, uh, or can be, very helpfully described using a vocabulary of information and especially when it comes to relating these deep down physics conversations to the higher level uh, questions that we also are addressing at the workshop uh, of consciousness and what mm -hmm. human beings do. Mm -hmm. Why do we have free will and the ability to make choices? As Janan Ismail has, has wrote, written in her book, it has a lot to do with the flow of information at an effective level uh, through our our humanness, our, our information processing capabilities. Mm -hmm. well, well, we're coming to lunchtime now. And so what I, I, I'd love to do is to give um, each member of the panel a chance to make a sort of closing statement. But I, I'd like to ask this, rather than just um, stating what your preferred interpretation is, because we may already have got a bit of a sense of that, I wonder if you could address the question how, as uh, rigorous thinkers and people who like you know, scientific methods of 
testing things to see whether they might be true or false. How might we acquire new information, new data, that would help us to resolve some of the things we're talking about? How, what, what, what might enable us to know whether a given position is true or false? What new way, what methodology might there be for choosing between these? And please don't give a biased answer to which, you know, the answer obviously is that it'll show that my method of thinking about it is the right one. So please uh, be a little bit disinterested, if you can, from your own personal point of view. And we might um, alternate between the two sides. So would someone this side like to address that? In other words, what kind of methodology might in future help us to resolve uh, the sort of things we're discussing this morning? So, I mean, I put forward the point of view, as I already said, that um, at the time, for the time being, the wave function has a, super, has a supermatic um, way of describing things that we can um, describe everything, both formally and experimentally, with um, the Schrodinger equation or its relativistic generalization. Of course, that, taking literally, leads to the Everett interpretation. And this is maybe why um, many people look for alternatives, because they don't like this interpretation. Um, so your question about maybe making a decision is, and this is ongoing, I mean, you should, on the theoretical side, develop quantitative alternatives like GRW, CSL, um, master equation, and so on, and then give precise tests. And they're on the way with quantum optics, quantum information, there are these experiments with Bowmaster et al., with the mirrors, and so on, so that you can uh, look for deviations from uh, unitary evolution. So far, we have not seen any, and this is why I stick to this conservative viewpoint of the Schrodinger equation. So simplicity for the equations, but maybe not simplicity for the worldview in sense of everything. Okay, thanks. Who's going to go this side? I can go. Um, well, it's hard. I think that a lot of the questions I'm most interested in are ones for which our theoretical understanding of the issues is not very well developed, not developed enough to pinpoint a crucial experiment that we can go out and do. So there are a lot of fishing expeditions, you know, looking for new particles, looking for polarization signals of inflation in the CMB, looking for the dark matter, time dependence of the dark energy, etc. Perhaps uh, the one I'm most interested in that I think deserves more attention is really testing general relativity, classical general relativity, near the event horizons of black holes to real, really map out the metric of uh, the Kerr metric near black holes, which we can now do that we have gravitational waves as uh, a research tool in astrophysics. If we had something like the LISA experiment, uh, the uh, satellite-based detector for gravitational waves, we could look for small black holes spiraling into supermassive black holes. And that would really let us map out in great detail the space-time metric around a gigantic, very rapidly spinning black hole. Probably Einstein and Kerr were right about that. But when you're within one Schwarzschild radius of what the black hole is doing, there's at least a non-trivial chance that even quantum gravitational effects might lead to something interesting there. So I do hope that uh, now that we've discovered gravitational waves, the governments of the world get more enthusiastic about space-based gravitational wave astrophysics. Good, thanks. Um, well, I guess the only way forward that I see is to look for new physics and uh, see which of the two views it supports. So as I said at the beginning, I think the view that I advocate does indicate certain clues as to where physics should go and directions for development of new physics with regard to laws that apply kind of all at once externally rather than internally. Um, that would lead to, it, that one would hope would work on that in that direction would lead to new predictions which you could go out and test. Um, the other view is I think more conservative because it basically says physics is all right already. So I guess it's kind of a question of can the, the view I, I advocate come up with new predictions that um, shake the existing status quo or not. Thanks very much. I think the, uh, the cultivating the habit of trying to see uh, many different ways of, of explaining things uh, will help us get away from, from uh, unproductive arguments about which, which interpretation or which uh, language for describing this quantum reality that we're all familiar with. Uh, is right because it's problem I think more this is what I call the tired old problem uh, in science not a problem like the solar neutrino problem 
which, uh, which was a real problem and then it had a real solution. Here, a lot of what we need to do is to, to understand the many languages for talking about quantum things, uh, perhaps re very much highlighted in what Sean said, looking at really different ways of trying to, in uh, to integrate quantum mechanics and GR because it's obviously going to be pretty hard. Uh, and we should be cultivating an open mind by listening to each other's uh, interpretations. Uh, for example, Sean was saying, well, uh, we're going to have to put in an arrow of time somewhere here. And that seems to me to be uh, sweeping a very enormous thing under the rug. Uh, and I guess you might say, if I understood what he said correctly, <laughs> that just having this uh, 2 to the 140th or something uh, uh, low entropy ancilla and then just saying it's, well, it's just plain quantum information after that, that's, well, I guess it's a big, pretty big rug, but it sort of answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think it's very productive to worry about it in, in a lot of different ways and not to, to uh, bash other people's ways of worrying about it. If there's no actual scientific disagreement, just an agreement of the language that we're using. Thanks. <laughs> My. Well, I cannot uh, propose any other experiment. My, my problem with the experiments that we have to keep in mind is usually when we have data, we analyze them under a particular kind of uh, theoretical framework. And then what we find at the end of the day is not verification of the theory, but consistency between the assumption and the result. So that's something that we should keep in mind when we want to design new experiments or to go out and just uh, advertise what the experiment taught us. For instance, people go around saying we proved lambda CDM. We haven't. We have found consistency between lambda CDM and the data. The same goes to, to, the, to the gravitational wave state. I mean, uh, consistency with the GR. But actually, then we have to go and test beyond the GR theories. Actually, I mean, I'm a member of LIGO, and now one of the things that we try to do is also that. So I cannot give you any other new experiment that could be done, but just to be cautious about when we come with results of experiments to keep in mind that, I mean, there is not any proof of something. It's consistency between the bias under which you have analyzed the data you got. Bill, you have the awesome responsibility of the closing remark. Oh, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> so event, um, I tend to agree with Carlo that one wants to look in the Heisenberg representation, not because it's mathematically different than the Schrodinger. I mean, that was proven X years ago that the two are mathematically completely equivalent, but that it causes you to think about and look at quantum mechanics in a different way. That the behavior, you know, in, in Schrodinger, the state carries everything in it, um, both the dynamics and the specification, how you put conditions on the world. And that distinction, I think, is a valuable distinction that Heisenberg representation makes clear uh, as a distinction. Uh, then process, um, you were asking how we should proceed. One of the things that's happened over the last 20, 30 years in our views, especially of quantum mechanics, is our willingness to dig down and do little problems trying to apply quantum mechanics to actual physical situations, things that could actually be measured at least in principle, and trying to see what quantum mechanics says there. Looking for the uh, um, unexpected, for example, uh, Aharonov has done an, an absolutely wonderful job of constantly showing us that there are really expected, unexpected features in quantum mechanics. I think all of these sort of small calculations that we can do instead of um, the very, very large speculations about how the theory should look and how the theory should behave is probably a much, has been a much more fruitful way of getting ahead in this field. And I guess I would encourage us to continue doing that and certainly continue doing experiments like some of the experiments we heard about. Um, uh, continue doing experiments like that, which can then increase our ability to, our intuition of using quantum mechanics in the real world. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.